So welcome back to another case of Meet the Candidates. We have Natalina Linos. You're coming back for round number two with us. We appreciate it. And uh, certainly we're closing in on election day. It's a busy time for you. So we definitely appreciate you joining us. Of course, Brett, this is a great opportunity to connect with voters who are, many have already started voting. So I'm really glad to be here with you today. Absolutely. We wanted to touch on some of the, the more uh, pressing issues as we're closing in on election day. The first and number one issue I think everyone is talking about is obviously school reopening. And who better to discuss this with than our resident epidemiologist, Natalina Linos. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about this. I think it's so important to talk to you about what is it that schools should be looking at? What should towns be considering when considering reopening their school? Thanks so much, Brett. And, you know, I think I should mention that you're talking to me wearing two hats. My first hat is as an epidemiologist. The other hat is as a mom of a seven-year-old who's entering second grade in Brookline public schools. Uh, I also have three-year-old twins. Um, so I'll speak both as an epidemiologist and as a parent, because I think I share the same anxiety that every parent across the district is feeling right now. Fear, fear about schools not reopening, and also fear about schools reopening. We're caught in this, you know, between a rock and a hard place. It is a really difficult time for every single parent I know, um, especially parents who may be essential workers and out of the house, single parents. Um, and those who have kids that are vulnerable in some way, whether they have a disability or something else. So it's a complex issue. And Brett, let's talk about it. But there are a lot of sides to this issue. Absolutely, which I'll note that also we've been, I've been seeing a lot on Facebook, your son Leo is in your, your last advertisement, which is adorable and I've loved it. So absolutely appreciate that, that, that we've been seeing. But what are some of the things that schools should be looking at? I know that realistically, there's three models that most schools are looking at. You have either the complete virtual learning going back into complete virtual, which some of the towns in our area, I know KP has suggested complete virtual. Um, Medfield actually just looked at a hybrid model. Um, and that's another way that people are doing it. And then the other option, which I don't know many towns that are doing this, but the complete reopen and just having kids go back what are towns considering? What should they look at? So those are the three models exactly as you said. I think it's challenging because every model has its advantages and every model has its disadvantages. Let's talk about the remote, complete remote. Um, that one obviously is the safest from a public health perspective, but it clearly is not the best from an education perspective or a parent perspective. It is so difficult for little kids, especially, you know, the pre-K, K, first grade, second grade to learn the basics while sitting in front of a Zoom, you know, or a computer for six hours a day. It simply is impossible to have that socio-emotional learning that is so critical at early ages. So I think remote learning for little kids is pretty much uh, a problem. And it's a problem that a lot of parents acknowledge because, you know, as a mom of a seven-year-old and of the three-year-olds, if my daughter is to be remote completely, I will have to be there with her, helping her log on, helping her read instructions. She's not a fluent reader yet. And that also means that I won't be able to be working at the same time. So it means that a lot of working parents are going to have to pull back from their work in order to be able to supervise. It also means that wealthy parents may be able to hire a tutor or a babysitter and parents that don't have the means are basically caught in a very difficult position. So let me say that remote comes with a lot of challenges. And if we are going to go remote, we need to make sure that we're addressing those challenges and the inequities that can arise. The other model is the complete open, everybody, you know, K through eight, K through 12 going back open. I don't think anybody is advocating for that. The hybrid model is what seems to be resonating and there's different ways of thinking about hybrid. Hybrid in terms of classes. So what Brookline is considering is K through two being in person, but using the entire space of the school to spread out and then having three through 12 basically, or three through, you know, depending on which schools are we talking the elementary or the high schools um, being part remote part uh, in person. I think, you know, the most important thing to recognize is that public health keeping our rates in Massachusetts, our COVID transmission rates low is the best way to keep our schools open. 
So number one is making sure that schools are prioritized. And you know, there's a hashtag on Twitter that says schools before bars, um, which is important to point out. You know, we have right now indoor dining that Governor Baker has allowed. I don't think that's appropriate. I think indoor dining is dangerous. And with you know, the rates slowly increasing again in Massachusetts, if we want schools first to open, but also to stay open, we need to close everything that is non-essential, you know, even gyms, uh, museums, movie theaters, you know, all of that I think should not be open so that we can have an option for at least some in-person instruction. How difficult is it for you to make that suggestion or, or, you know, I mean, I know that you look at it as an epidemiologist, as a resident, you hear those words and you're like, oh, we're doing this all over again. But how important is it for us to come out of this and do the right thing um, to be able to keep people safe? It's really important. And it's not only to keep people fit safe. I mean, I think every parent also wants that, also wants to make sure that schools can open because for parents, basically having the kids at home means they can't work or they have this additional stress of trying to educate their kids, you know, if, you know, if it's, it's on them. So I think what is most important is to say that if we say, you know, movie theaters and gyms need to close, that these small businesses or businesses need to be provided money, right? We're not shutting them down and saying, go fire all your employees. We're saying, stay closed, make sure that your employees have unemployment insurance or that you have a loan from the government in order to stay afloat. So um, I think what hasn't happened is a prioritization of which small businesses are critical. And the ones that I think are critical are childcare centers, schools, and critical for both the education of the kids, but also for parents to be able to do what they need to do. So it's tough. But I hear from teachers and staff that they're scared to go back into the buildings. But what I want to point out is let's be creative. You know, outdoor instruction is possible in Massachusetts right now. It won't be possible in January and February. And so I don't want us to waste this month, September and October, trying to get everything right. And then, you know, it'd be too cold for us to be able to do outside instruction. So a lot of, you know, a lot of the public health community is saying, we have got the virus under control. Some in-person instruction makes sense immediately so that kids can start bonding and that there are vulnerable kids and younger kids that need to be prioritized for schools. Absolutely, a lot of tough decisions going ahead. We'll ch change gears now to climate change. I know one of the things that uh, we talked about in our last episode, people can go back and see that, is your COVID-19 plan is involving everything. It involves a lot of discussion of, you know, health and, but also a huge emphasis on climate change. Um, it's one of the things that you looked at as an epidemiologist and your work with the UN, your work outside of the United States as climate change affects everything that we talk about. So how important is climate change going forward? What are some of the things that we should be considering? Brett, that's a great question. You know, before this pandemic, everybody said the existential threat is climate change. Even with this pandemic, that still is an existential threat. We really have moved too slow. You know, the IPCC, which is an independent panel on, you know, a global level has said that, you know, unless we get our temperature under control, you know, we are going to be putting ourselves on a trajectory that is irreversible. You know, already we're seeing glaciers in Greenland that have crossed a threshold. You know, a lot of climate science is around thresholds. And when you cross a threshold, when the system works in a way that it reinforces itself, and we are running out of time. And it's not about, you know, 70 years down the line. We're talking about our kids being in a planet that is difficult to live in. And let me give you some examples, you know, heat waves. Heat waves are causing hundreds and thousands of excess deaths. And, you know, you don't think about it because it's, you know, you live in a climate, you, you have your air conditioning, but we have seen places like Paris where tons of elderly died during heat waves. You know, it, it's not even, you know, in, in parts of the world that you think are remote and very poor. In wealthy countries, heat waves have caused this. We know that climate change is going to lead to an increase of more diseases like malaria, 
you know, in places like Mexico City, where it's the altitude right now protects because the mosquitoes aren't there, you know, the malaria mosquitoes, in a few years, we expect them to be there. So we're going to see changes in our environment in, you know, for, for us in Massachusetts, Lyme disease is going to increase because of climate change. Like we need to understand that the consequences are real, and they're real today, and they are real for the next generation. So number one is ensuring that we are taking this seriously. Um, you know, there's a lot of skepticism, but we don't have time to be skeptics. We have to act. So as an epidemiologist and as someone who believes in science, I'm going to be one of the strongest advocates on the climate front. And I have worked at the United Nations for many years leading this climate and health portfolio. And I'm excited to lead um, to ensure that the Green New Deal is passed and that there is real progress on, you know, a green future for us. Yeah, one of the things that uh, I ended up looking into the Green New Deal, I, I know that it was one of the things that you uh, really support, you stand by, and it's really, it's not a bill, it's a statement, it's a, an, an acknowledgement that this is a, a crisis and that we need to do something. One of the things that I actually felt was really powerful with the Green New Deal was its acknowledgement that the changes that's going to go forward are going to be vast and are going to create changes in a lot of different aspects of life. And so one of the reasons why the Green New Deal, uh, or one of the big parts of the Green New Deal, it's really separated, it's 14 pages. People might think that this is some giant document. It's only 14 pages, but it encompasses this idea that we need education, we need to create job reforms, we need to actually work on a lot, a grand scale, a changing of the entire economy, really, uh, going forward, if we're going to do this. The change that they're looking for, I think it was an increase of two degrees in 2050 is going to be the drastic change. That's the number that we're looking at. Um, tell me a little bit about the Green New Deal, the things that you saw in it, and, and, and what you're looking at. Yeah. So it's basically keeping our climate below that two degree threshold. And we're on a path to be way, way above that. We need to keep, we need to take action so that our, our climate doesn't increase by more than two degrees because that would be catastrophic. The types of things uh, that I like about the Green New Deal, Brett, is that it talks about just transitions. It talks about inequities. You know, it's not, it's not blind to the fact that we, you know, some people are going to lose their jobs. We have to transition away from coal and away from fossil fuels towards green energy. And that means that people who work on those industries feel threatened and, and industries that are related to that. And so we need to make sure that this is done with people in mind and who are the, you know, winners and who are the losers. I don't want to use such crude terms, but we have to play it out and make sure that we are protecting and ensuring that those people get job training, are supported to to transition with us. There shouldn't be winners and losers. This should be a win-win for everyone, for our planet, for our children, and for the people currently who are in jobs that are seen as problematic, meaning we need to get away from fossil fuels. So the types of issues that are central to me, and I think to the fourth district, are around energy. And you know we know that places like Fall River and Taunton and Somerset can provide labor for offshore wind. You know, offshore wind has such potential. Massachusetts could be the place where green energy and offshore is basically a major source. You know, we already know solar panels and solar energy and other, you know, forms of renewables are, make sense economically. Offshore, we haven't done yet enough as an experiment. In a lot of Europe, there is offshore wind, but not in the US. And Massachusetts has a lot to gain. So, you know, people like Pat Haddad and others are big advocates for the job part. You know, it creates jobs, green jobs for our district. So I'd be a strong advocate of green jobs. I'd also be a strong advocate of public transportation. You know, in, in, our, in Massachusetts, 40% of emissions are because of transportation. And that's bad. It's also bad for families to have to be stuck in traffic for two hours each way, not families. Usually it's a parent who is away from their kids driving for two hours into Boston and driving back and having no time to spend with you know, their kids and being frustrated, being in a car, paying money. And so you know, making sure that we invest in public transportation makes sense both from a climate perspective, a health perspective, because clean air is good for our health and also walking, which is encouraged through public transportation, is, is good for our health. And it's good for people to get to their jobs. And, you know, I haven't talked about this yet, but I had an event yesterday on um, disability rights 
and accessibility is really key. Making sure that our public transportation system is also accessible for people who are in wheelchairs, for people who may be blind or deaf and may not be able to drive cars themselves for any of these reasons. So I'm, I'm excited for really being a candidate that will push for much more investment in public transportation. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a very vast plan. That's a great point that you make, though, too, is the uh, people with disabilities, obviously senior citizens, things like that, um, a huge uh, investment in transportation. I know one of the things that you actually talk about is bike lanes as well, is being able to actually give people a safe way of utilizing different forms of transportation. So uh, a vast plan for sure is the Green New Deal. One of the other things that it talks about is actually in education and job opportunities, they talk about actually trying to create uh, ways that indigenous people uh, and low income uh, people can actually have opportunities to rise up um, through these new jobs, through education. Uh, is that something that you, that you saw in the Green New Deal? Yeah. You know, this is important to say that there's an environmental justice piece and the language around justice is important because we know that um, the impacts of climate change, but also of air pollution and environmental issues right now are not distributed equally. You know, in parts of Brookline, you have nice parks, you don't have a lot of pollution, you don't have toxic waste. In other parts of even Massachusetts, you have neighborhoods that are exposed to, you know, polluted water. Um, you know, I have talk to people in, in Norton who are worried about their drinking water, the same as in other parts of our district. We need to recognize that air pollution, water pollution, and climate change is impacting different communities um, unequally. And so climate action should take into account making sure that we remedy this, and also making sure that communities that have historically been hurt are able to benefit from these new green jobs. You know, we need to make sure that it's not just, you know, workers from Brookline who are getting green jobs, but workers from across our district. So I like that the Green New Deal um, suggests also, and, and some legislation that has kind of come off of it and, and other ideas that there's a targeting of say 40% of the federal government's investment has to be tied to reach, you know, black, brown, indigenous, and low income or working class families and that they benefit from this investment. Now, uh, the, the third and uh, I'll, I'll call it our final thing I'll talk to you about today is the police reform. Uh, this is obviously a big uh, issue that people are talking about. Again, we wanted to talk about those big issues that are coming down the pipeline for people. Um, you talk a lot about police reform, um, that it's, uh, you have certain things, you actually have seven different topics underneath it that you're suggesting that people can look to change, that you could make a difference as a congresswoman that you could actually do. Um, first of all, tell me about your policies in police reform, and then we can get into some of the nitty gritty details. Sure. So Britt, I think first of all, it's important to recognize that our budgets should reflect our values as a society. You know, what do we really want? We want our kids to be healthy. We want education. We want us to, you know, have the well being. And, and how do we ensure that our budgets and what we're putting money actually gets us to those ends? And I think taking that step back is important. What we have done in this country is we have criminalized poverty, we have criminalized mental illness, we have criminalized homelessness. And these are social issues, and we need to address them as social issues. So the process of thinking through rebudgeting and you know policing is a punitive approach you know this is a wrong we punish it but we've kind of been punishing the wrong things you know i believe that schools need to have nurses they need to have social workers we need to be thinking about kids mental health and their well-being and policing kids is not you know the right strategy the same with policing people for being poor. You know, how do we make sure that we are actually investing in communities rather than punishing communities? And that's where the shift has to happen. And, you know, the language has been kind of controversial, the, you know, defund the police or refund communities. But let's take a step back and say, you know, police officers don't want to be the ones dealing with someone having a mental health crisis on the street. They don't want to be in that position. They don't want to be in schools if there's a better person, meaning a social worker. So my strategy is let's invest more in the things that matter to us. And that means health, that means our environment, that means our mental health, our social well-being. Um, and that requires a rethinking of, of our systems and who are the best, who is best placed to serve in that capacity. 
I think oftentimes we get stuck in those little statements, the hashtags that we use. I think that they're great for something to be able to say, you know, uh, there's great uh, to be able to be someone who can say, hey, I think we should defund the police in a quick little statement. But that is such a, a large idea that I think you do a great job of breaking down as to what you're actually looking for in the defund the police. People can go uh, to your website and, and actually read more about that. One of the things I actually thought was interesting is, again, I hear this all the time, is criminalizing poverty. And you, you just talked a little bit about it. One of the things you suggest is to stop cash bail or to reduce cash bail um, to eliminate uh, mandatory minimums as well. These are things that you have on your site that you're talking about um, changing different things. Tell me about those two, why they're so important. They're so important, Brett, because basically with cash bail, what that means is if you have money, you, you can get out. And this is before you've been convicted of a crime, right? You get arrested and then bail is set. And, you know, it can be set as little as $100. And some people cannot afford that $100. And, you know, they are stuck in a jail, which is not a good place to be stuck. When I worked at the New York City Health Department, um, the the New York City Health Department was in charge of correctional health. So we oversaw the health of uh, incarcerated populations on Rikers Island. We saw kids that had been arrested, you know, for, you know, petty crimes, and they couldn't pay the $100 bill. And then they were acting out, and then they were put in solitary confinement, and then they were having mental health crises. You know, there was a few um, kind of media coverage of a couple, there was a boy who, you know, it was something so minor, he couldn't pay bail. Finally, after a few years, he was released and then he committed suicide, you know, but that trauma of being in jail, uh, when you haven't committed a crime, and even if you had, if it's something small, like, you know, uh, but basically, poor people are left in jails, and people who have the means can pay the $500 or the $1,000. And that just seems fundamentally wrong. You know, we don't want to be keeping people in jail because they can't pay bail. We want to be keeping people in jail because they're a threat to the rest of us. So if there's a credible threat, you know, if somebody has, you know, if, if there's a, a real threat that you believe that someone is at risk, you don't just increase the bail, you just make that not an option. So bail reform is really important to ensure that we're not just keeping people in jails because they're poor. You know, so that I feel very strongly about. One of the other ones that you have is invest in reintegration. I think that this is such an important issue. Um, one of the things that we oftentimes don't think about is when people get out, they're oftentimes uh, marginalized, they're not thought of. Um, it's very difficult for people to leave jail and then to get you know, back into society. I mean, that's the whole point, right? Is once you're in jail to come out and be able to come back into normal life. And so one of the things you actually talk about is to reduce community supervision. Um, and that's something that I felt like was really important. I actually didn't realize the statistics of how many people are led to reincarceration due to technical probation violations, which you point out on your website is one of the reasons why people keep going back into jail. These are non-criminal violations. These are things like not showing up to a meeting or things like not having a job, which is oftentimes a really tough thing to do once you've been in jail. So tell me about this, the invest, reinvesting into, uh, I should say, invest into reintegration. Exactly. So if we believe, and it's an if, right? I, I actually am more of a restorative justice person. Like I don't actually believe uh, that for a lot of, you know, there's obviously some extreme situations where, you know, jail makes sense. But some sometimes I do think we, we use a punitive approach to harshly and, and a restorative justice approach where you have people coming together and finding a solution that works both for the person who was harmed and the person who did the harming. And there can be, you know, creative ways to, to really reform our entire system. But okay, so imagine though that we're going with the old system and you've served your time and then you come out and you're not able to get a job, you're not able to vote, you're not able to find housing because you're excluded from, you know, federal sort of support to housing. Um, you know, you are basically in such a hard place that anybody in that situation would have a hard time not you know, being able to basically meet those guidelines and the, those check boxes. So instead of repunishing people, we should say, okay, now you have a clean slate. And we recognize that those you know, two years, five years, 10 years in prison 
mean that you don't have the networks and you might not have family that will take you back in. And so we will ensure that for the immediate term, you have housing, you have any you know, mental health support because it's hard. It's hard transitioning back into society and that we are there to get help you get a job, not punish you for not getting a job. And that requires an entire shift. And, you know, it's a compassionate way of engaging with the criminal legal system. But I think that's the only way forward that is truly going to move us forward to say that we have, you know, engaged in a way that is a restorative way and not a, a punitive way. So, you know, maybe some some people on, on, who are listening to me will think that I'm too naive or too much of an optimist, but I do believe that uh, people, if given the means, are likely to, you know, want to do well. You know, there are a few exceptions, but they're not the norm. And we have punished too many people for too long. And we need to be able to say that as a society, we are building a future that works for everyone. And so we are in that rebuilding mode. We need to think about the human rights of our incarcerated population and their families and what they need and what we can do to ensure that they are reintegrated in a way that is beneficial for everybody, for our neighborhoods, for our, our neighbors, for our friends. So. Brett, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to engage with me on this conversation because I feel strongly that we have just gotten it wrong. And, you know, we're the only country we have, I think we have 20% of the world's population in, in prisons. And we are only 5% of the world in terms of our population. We have gotten this wrong compared to every other country. So let's do better. Absolutely. Natalia, thank you so much for joining us yet again on this. Um, I think you again, I'll say it's a very difficult race. It's very tough. Um, it's a grueling race as well. There's so much going on. I feel like uh, it's very difficult for the candidates right now to, to actually have some time to, to rest and relax. But I appreciate you coming out and uh, joining us yet again. You give another reason for Medfield residents to cast their vote for you. Please vote for me between now and September 1. And any day you have questions, I'm online on Zoom. Monday through Friday at noon, just engaging with voters. And I am there in person on Zoom, but in person and to just take questions. So I'd love to connect with many of you. And Brett, thank you for the opportunity to chat again. It's always fun. Mm -hmm.